My guest today is Douglas Crockford. Douglas, how are you? Great. Thanks for being back on my show. You bet. Um, I just enjoyed your keynote here at Beer City Code, and uh, you were talking. Well, you talked about a lot of things, but the thing I took about away uh, took away from it was the uh, the idea that there are things that are either lacking or ambiguous in current today's language, and that could be better if you were the creator of the next language. Is that is that right? Well, obviously, the world would be better if if I was in charge of everything. Okay, we'll probably wait like uh, six months or so for that right. to happen. But that, that wasn't really the point of my talk. It, it was more <laughs> that because of the iterative way in which we tend to build things, our systems get very cluttered. That it's very easy to add new features mm -hmm. and it's very difficult to remove new features. Yes. But just the incidence of clutter makes programming more difficult because there are choices that have to be made where if it were a cleaner architecture, it'd be obvious what the correct thing is. And sometimes things which look to be virtually identical or interchangeable aren't, that there are cases where the differences are really significant. Right. But because they're so similar looking, it's not obvious that those differences are there and so they turn into traps. Right. So I gave the example of HTTP in which we have post, put, and patch. Right which all tell the server to receive some information and do something with it, and they appear to be interchangeable. But they each have a particular role, but there is so much overlap that it's really confusing as to which one you should use. Ah. And so people will waste a lot of time researching it or arguing about it or making dire predictions about catastrophes that are gonna happen by using the wrong one. And all of that could be avoided if it were just one verb and not three. Mm. And that's just a simple example. We right. see stuff like that. So in when you're king of the universe, there will only be one word. There will be one it. word, yeah. <laughs> and, and that will be all the things that we use to, to okay. tell a server to store post. something. I don't care what the word is. <laughs> store might have been a better one. Store? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I don't But so in, in general, any time we give programmers a choice between two or more ways of doing things, there's a likelihood that some of them will get extremely emotionally attached to one and others violently attached to another. Right. And that makes interoperability between those two groups much more difficult. They spend too much time arguing and, and rewriting each other's code and, and stuff. And it could be really trivial stuff like tabs versus spaces. Right, yeah. Which there's is a people silly that like argument. The spaces and there's, there's dopes that like the tabs. <laughs> That's been going on <laughs> since the invention of time sharing you know, and that was when computers were first attached to terminals going all the way back and there used to be a good argument for tabs because uh, the networks were really slow we measured them in characters per second oh so tab would give you like 10 characters at once yeah that, 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 once that was a huge optimization <laughs> that doesn't exist anymore right. the networks are so fast and we should be g-zipping anyway so and minifying so all of that goes away but you still see people making the, the space-saving argument. Right. Even though we have terabyte storage now in personal devices, they're still arguing about I'm saving spaces by using tabs. Right. That, I mean, that's a trivial argument. It doesn't really matter in the grand scheme of things. It's in the noise, are. yeah. But uh, it's one decision that we have to make. And generally, a team has to make it because otherwise the code looks funny. If right, and, and there are other teams. And if someone deviates, then it screws up source control right. because we've got commits that aren't changing anything, but are just cluttering stuff yeah. up. Or, or diffs that are not meaningful, but they're there. I just checked it out, changed all the tabs to spaces, and checked it back <laughs> in until Joe <laughs> did the same thing <laughs> in the reverse. <laughs> yeah, so uh, life's too short for that. Life is too so, short, there's, there's a know, waste of time. Yeah, and well, Joe's wrong. We're, <laughs> we're at war, pick a side, you know? <laughs> so the, the problem is that we try to resolve questions like that in terms of, which one is better. Okay. And the which is better argument for both sides are really weak. And the other side can hear that that side's argument is weak. And therefore they assume, well, therefore my, my argument must be strong. <laughs> I hear the same thing in the presidential debates. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's not just programmers. The, the, the world is having trouble with this stuff. So, so asking which one is better doesn't lead to a conclusion. The question we should be asking is, which one can we get rid of? Okay. 
and then it becomes really easy. Well, tabs obviously is the one that we can get rid of. We can't get rid of spaces because we still need spaces between words. Okay, yeah. And we have proof that you can live without tabs. The people who use spaces are the existence proof of that. Mm. So we shouldn't be using tabs anymore. Mm. And if we could agree on that, then all of that arguing goes away, all of the questions about which one, fixing each other's code, you know, all, all that kind of textual sabotage, all of that goes away. So that, that's, um, and then, like you pointed out earlier, that's really hard to do in an existing language, like, like JavaScript, which has been around for decades. Uh, if we were trying to get rid of any feature, we would break a lot of code. Yeah, so uh, that's why I'm an advocate of new languages. Okay. And unfortunately, the, the tendency right now is to try to keep the old languages alive. Like, there's still a lot of invention going on around C++. Mm -hmm. You think that's a language that should have been put in the ground a long time ago, but they're still adding lots of new stuff to that. And, you know, most of the languages we have now are old languages. Right. And I think we should be embracing new languages. Now, the web is partially responsible for that because the web does not tolerate new languages. That um, it was so difficult to make JavaScript into a, a secure enough language that going through that process again for another language, it's like nobody wants to, to mess with it. Hmm. Like um, many years ago, as an experiment, Mozilla put uh, Python in, into their browser, hmm. but they never switched it on because they didn't want to go through the hassle of proving that Python didn't have the security problems that they'd already fixed for JavaScript. Interesting. Uh, there's also the, the headache of teaching everyone a new language. People are comfortable, they have existing applications, and this idea of uh, first one learning a new language and then two porting old applications to a new language is, is daunting. Well, except we have to do that anyway. For example, we have a generation of Java and C Sharp programmers who now have to work in JavaScript because that's okay. where the jobs are going. Okay. And they're really struggling with that because they're still trying to write in C sharp, but the language isn't C sharp, but it looks enough like it that you can easily get confused. And so Microsoft has offered them TypeScript, which kind of brings them closer together, but mm -hmm. in a way amplifies the confusion because it looks even more like C sharp, but it's still JavaScript. Yeah, I, I think the way that I like to use tools like TypeScript or CoffeeScript or something like that is it's a gateway into JavaScript. So JavaScript for me was very daunting until I discovered jQuery. jQuery was, it eased my transition to, into it. And even though I don't use jQuery anymore, yeah, cause it, it helped me get over that hump and I had less fear of it. But yeah, maybe the, TypeScript is the same way. Well, the hard thing about working in the browser isn't JavaScript, it's the DOM. It's the browser's yes, that API. Was a, exactly what the, the fear was for me. Or yeah, the, yeah, it's the awful. The challenge it's was for me. One of the worst APIs ever imagined. <laughs> and Microsoft, to its credit, actually improved it quite a lot. In IE4 and IE5, they mm -hmm. made changes to the DOM. But unfortunately, they didn't finish. And so they left it in this unfinished <laughs> state, and it's still really awful. Yeah. Um, so we, we see people trying to move into JavaScript without having to, to relearn JavaScript. Uh, so I was an advocate of, of CoffeeScript as an educational tool. Mm -hmm. So I, because JavaScript, or CoffeeScript made the good parts of JavaScript easier to see. Hmm. Because in a way they're obscured by the Java syntax. Okay. But the CoffeeScript syntax, the, the goodness kind of yeah, popped out a little bit JavaScript that looks more. a lot like Ruby as I remember. Um, yeah, kind of. And okay. a little Pythonic, there are a number of influences, but it, it was a really clever thing. And I recommended people learn CoffeeScript because that will make you better at writing JavaScript. Mm -hmm. I also told them, don't put it in production. I bet they didn't listen to that. They didn't part. listen. So there are all these <laughs> hipsters who, who convinced their companies to let them write CoffeeScript. And now those companies are stuck with all this CoffeeScript legacy, right? Because the hipsters have moved on to other stuff. <laughs> and they got all this stuff yeah. You know, what do you do with that? Uh, well, actually, here's a plug for TypeScript. TypeScript is, in fact, JavaScript, a superset of JavaScript. So you can 
add new functionality to it in pure JavaScript. Well, except it's, it's not, not adding functionality. It's it's adding a veneer. Oh, I know what you mean. I, I guess I should say that you can add new modules. Like, if, for example, if you have an application that's written in TypeScript, and you uh, you want to rewrite or you want to add new functionality to your application, you could do so in pure JavaScript and ignore the TypeScript. And yeah. later on, maybe you could rewrite the TypeScript if you if you feel that way. Well, you, CoffeeScript does too. I mean, it, it all turns into JavaScript. Right. Okay. Fair enough. But uh, my advice to everybody is learn to write well in JavaScript. And, and ultimately, I think that really should be the goal. And that's where I went when I, when I talked about jQuery is it didn't, uh, I used it as a crutch for a little while. And then once I was comfortable, then I, I was easier for me to relearn JavaScript because it, it, it got me past that fear of the DOM. Yeah. So I really like having some kind of library which gets between us and the DOM because we really need that protection. But these things have grown now into platforms and frameworks, and they've gotten really, really complex. Yeah. Um, and that, and they're also extremely sticky, which means mm -hmm. that once you commit to one, you know, you're you're kind of stuck with that. And so it's a, a really expensive mistake if you choose the wrong one. I think that's so. That was a theme that I saw in your keynote talk. Was everything you talked about was here's some issues that JavaScript currently has. Here's a proposed better way of doing it. In what if I built the next language, and your way was simpler. It was doing away with complexity and making things more direct, more simple, more straightforward, less ambiguous. Is that yeah? Fair? Um, yeah, I am a uh, reformer. And it seems like most people in the industry now are traditionalists. And they're trying to make progress while keeping everything the same as it always was. Hmm. And I'm more in favor of let's learn about what was good about the previous thing, throw it out, and, and make a new one. Hmm. Uh, do you have, what's your advice to people that are writing JavaScript today? What's, what's, what can do people do to write better JavaScript? Learn the language. Just take time to step back and learn the Le capabilities. Learn the language. That, um, so the biggest mistake I ever made with JavaScript was exactly that. It looked familiar. Got, you know, I recognize the syntax. You I think I know a, what it is. You were a Java developer before? I had been doing a lot of Java. This was in 2000. Right. About, well, it has the maybe. word Java in it, so it must be just like JavaScript. Yeah, and, and in fact, Netscape lied <laughs> about what JavaScript was because um, they had this alliance with Sun. The Sun wanted Java to become the language of the browser, so mm -hmm. Netscape implemented it. But they implemented it with uh, the silly language called LiveScript. And Sun was really annoyed that they had this because they were proclaiming that Java was the last language. You don't mm -hmm. need any other languages. And there was this LiveScript thing in there. And you got to take it out. And Netscape couldn't take it out. Oh, so they just renamed it? So they renamed it. I didn't know that. <laughs> and, and they repositioned it. It's not a different language. It's a subset of Java. It's, it's interpreted Java. It's Java's stupid little brother. Oh. Hmm. And, and people bought it. it yeah. I guess why not? <laughs> they said that's what it is. And a lot of people thought, you know, it, and that still echoes out there. Okay. Um, and so... I, and I heard that, and I made that mistake. So when I started working with Java, someone showed me the definitive guide, which was already a couple inches thick. And I said, mm -hmm. I don't have time to read that. I'll just... I'll just read the good parts. Well, well, I hadn't written the good parts. I'll just write yet. the good parts. <laughs> so I wrote it thinking that it was a subset of Java. And it punished me, and it kept punishing me over and over until I finally took the time to read the language standard, because... At that time, that was really the only source that explained okay. how the language worked. And then I had this epiphany. Oh, wow. He, this is Scheme with C syntax. Ah, uh, okay. It, so it's said, not oh, a I've subset of JavaScript. Yeah, I've, I've, I've been thinking about it wrong from the beginning. Hmm. And, and that started me on a path. And once I, I found that connection, then I was able to recognize what the good parts were. Okay. And the, the JavaScript, the good parts, is, of course, your book, which is uh, not only an iconic book in the JavaScript library, but it's uh, a famous meme to have your book this thick <laughs> next to a book called JavaScript, which is this thick, <laughs> and this, uh, implying that the good parts are a fraction of the entire language. Yeah, in fact, that's right. <laughs> and uh, you are writing another book right now, right? And, and I've got another book. It's, it's going to be called How JavaScript Works, and it'll be a much bigger book. Mm -hmm about how the language works and how to use it well.
When is that coming out? I'm hoping to get it out this year. Okay. I was also hoping to get it out in time for this show, but it's the book has sort of turned into a software project. So are, you, are you still writing it, or are you in the editing process now? I am still writing it. Okay. Uh, and uh, I just, uh, at the end of your talk, somebody asked a question, which I thought was a great question. You are the inventor of the JSON standard. I, how how I, does one pronounce JSON? I only claim to have discovered it. You discovered it. It, it, <laughs> it already existed in nature. I, I just identified it. Gave it a name and showed how it could okay, be Okay, you were the paleontologist who discovered yeah, it. It's sort of like <laughs> saying that George Washington Carver invented the peanut. <laughs> okay. I, I don't think he would. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> but so he the, did show I how to I still want to know, how does one pronounce J-S-O-N? So I always called it Jason. Uh, Jason, like the person's name. Like the Jason. person's name. And I, most uh, people who didn't know how, what I call it called it Jason, which is completely that's reasonable. That's um, It turns out the correct pronunciation is Jason. Jason. All right. Fair enough. You hear it here first. Douglas Crockford, thank you so much. You bet. I wish we had some shawarma technology, friends. <laughs>